And I always ask my mother, I said, Mother, how come is everything white? I said, why is Jesus white with blonde and blue eyes? Why is the Lord's <laughs> Supper all white men? Angels are white. Pope and the Mary and every, even the angels. I said, Mother, when we die, do we go to heaven? She said, naturally, we go to heaven. I said, well, what happened to all the black angels when they took the pictures? <laughs> Racial diversity in fashion is not just a long overdue moral imperative. It's also a business imperative. Famous management consulting business McKinsey's will tell you that in business, and the business of fashion is no exception, increasing diversity is not just a moral imperative. It is also becoming a powerful business requirement. Diversity and representation is also good for the bottom line. Organizations equipped with a range of voices and perspectives throughout the ranks are better able to innovate, take risks, solve problems creatively, bounce back from failures, and turn challenges into opportunities. But progress around the world, especially in leadership roles, has been lackluster. Diversity is something that Marco Bizzari, president and CEO of Gucci since 2015, and creative director Alessandro Michele take seriously. I think that the fashion industry represents beauty. It represents what's aspirational, um, or it signals at least culturally what's aspirational to the rest of the world. So the fashion industry has an enormous responsibility for you know shifting the tides of pop culture, shifting the tides of what's you know, relevant and cool and, and beautiful and what deserves to be celebrated and all those things. And so I feel like diversity um, is crucial um, in fashion because it signals to the rest of the planet that this is something that's worth celebrating. This is something that deserves to be in advertising, deserves to be on the cover of magazines, deserves to be in fashion shows, deserves to be seen. If you had it all your way, how would the world look? Would it be filled with trouble and sorrow or opportunity and joy? Would we laugh and celebrate or cry and lament? Would we sit and watch each other struggle or leap at the chance to lend a hand and love? Would we? Even without differences? If you let your imagination run wild, what could community look like? Could it be the place where ideas are born and thrive? Could it offer strength and support? Could it challenge the status quo and take us to new heights? And at those new heights, perhaps clarity, a better view? So now what? Keep it all in your head, waiting for someone else to make it happen? We're waiting for you. You can change things. You have always been a mover and a shaker at home, at school, in your neighborhood. Now let's reimagine the world together as change makers and see how beautiful it can be. Beth Ann Hardison is a true fashion insider and a lifelong advocate for racial representation and diversity in the fashion industry. In 2020, Marco Bizzari appointed her as Gucci's executive advisor for global equity and cultural engagement in 2020 as a key part of their diversity initiative. The luxury fashion business has historically been run by older white males. In the past, senior executives of color in fashion houses and in media and retail could be counted on one hand, often just a tokenistic role such as editor at large or such with no real power. And the fashion industry has had a dismal reputation of glorifying overly thin white women. Yes, in the 90s, Naomi Campbell and later Alec Weck, and most recently, Aduta Kesh rose to supermodel status, but there were rarely more than a few women of color walking the runways back in the 90s. 
But as Bob Dylan used to sing, for the times, they are a-changing. Yeah, because like you said it before about the, the, when he talks about, once again, the word diversity, I'm always trying to use integration because I want to keep, keep going forward. We get stuck in this, this kind of way that people see things. And hmm, I don't like to talk about diversity and not practice it, you know? You know, you, you, that's the whole point. I want to see it all mixed. But I do think that there's, there's been such an improvement in what we see. And then, you know, of course, people got their way with plus size and, and, and girls who are much more voluptuous. And, uh, and that eventually worked for people. I mean, it doesn't work, you know, I'm, I'm like, whatever. But I'm still into beautiful blonde girls and brunettes and dark uh, tropical girls and black girls. And uh, I loved a lot of the Dominican girls. Today, the fashion industry is brimming with a new generation of models who better reflect the diverse world we live in. And I think that's one of the big problems with the modeling industry is we need to represent all of humanity and all the diversity. Um, and just like, you know, women have been sexualized and objectified, children have been sexualized and objectified in this industry, men the same. The other unique piece of this is we have our trans community coming out. We have our gay and lesbian community coming out and our queer community coming out and actually walking down the runways and being part of amazing photo shoots. And like, so there actually is in that sort of influx right in that tidal wave of um in that ebb and flow of it all there's actually an amazing community that's coming out in so many ways that absolutely needs to be represented because it's part of this global community more models of color grace the 2019 catwalks than ever before 90 percent of the top nyfw models in fact while stats in 2020 disappointedly revealed a decline in inclusivity at New York Fashion Week in three categories, race, size, and gender. We are hopeful that the 2020 year's lack of representation was an anomaly. Fashion's recent outcry against injustice has given us hope that there will be continual transformation. And when you begin to see in magazines that they are now becoming more inclusive, when you start to see runway shows, you start to see blacks, girls, guys, it begins to remind people that it's okay. It doesn't hurt. It's not going to make you sick. It's not a disease to be inclusive. If you were to point to just two young faces barely out of their teens who were leading this new diversity revolution, it would be Aduta Kesh and Alton Mason. I love Adut and Alton. Um, last time I worked with Alton, he was dancing like so incredible. And yeah, we, you, just, you just know that they're gonna become superstars. Um, Adut is so beautiful and, and she, they just got it. Um, I'm so excited to see what they're gonna do in the future. Um, yeah, they're, they're the new supermodels for sure. In true Disney princess tradition, many of the best female supermodel origin stories seem to follow the Cinderella plot archetype. Cinderella is more of a persecuted heroine rather than a damsel in distress, an orphan, outcast, and is often seen as innocent, who is aided by a fairy godmother and saved by a handsome prince who is enraptured by her beauty and innocence. In the original fairy tale, Cinderella is mistreated and ostracized by her stepmother and stepsisters and is kept from going to the big ball to meet the handsome prince. Like Cinderella, the model's journey seems all too predictable. Like Cinderella, their early journey sees them bullied, demeaned, ridiculed for being too gangly, too tall, too flat-chested, too strange-looking. Boys of the same age do not find them attractive. 
So many grow up believing themselves to be unlovable, even social outcasts. They say I look like it's called olive oil. So olive oil. Really? And I was with tease olive oil and I was called Twigs, Twigs and Lanky and all these. And I wasn't pretty at all. <laughs> Just like Cinderella, the young model is seen as sweet and soft-spoken and clearly vulnerable and unable to save herself. This is where the fairy godmother arrives out of the blue, be it at an airport for Kate Moss or a McDonald's for Giselle Bundchen. And the fairy godmother plucks them from obscurity and drops them into a life of international travel, money and acclaim. It's this archetype, overcoming adversity to achieve love and the immense dualities of the human experience, of good triumphant over evil, that has been duplicated. When it comes to overcoming adversity and good trumps over evil, the plotline of Cinderella and company have nothing on Aduda Ketch's origin story. Grew up in a refugee camp. Uh, didn't have a lot. Didn't really know what was going on. There was always war happening. Um, I didn't grow up in my home country. We were forced to, my family was forced to leave South Sudan. Um, Born on the way to Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. It's where I grew up for the first almost eight years of my life before moving to Australia. You know, every day was a different day. Every, there was fun days, scary days, sad days. Days you just didn't know if you're going to make it to tomorrow. And talking about like five, I still have memories from the, the age of five, six, seven. Um, It was tough, but you know, we we got through it. We got through it. And, you know, here I am. I was this tall, super shy, awkward kid. She says I had a weird name and a gap tooth. Track forward to 2019, where Adut was named 2019 Model of the Year at the British Fashion Awards. That's a award. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than just a title in this industry. It is for the little girls and boys who are not heard and seen. It is for refugees all around the world who are in a tough position in their life right now and feel like there's no way out. Aketch credits her indefatigable work ethic to her single parent mother. After arriving in Australia as a refugee, Aketch's mother worked in a laundry as a supervisor. She'd wake up at 4 a.m. and come home at 10 p.m. Akech is a long-time diversity campaigner. She's spoken about her experience as a refugee for the United Nations and championed the representation of darker-skinned models in the industry. It goes to show that you think that every African person looks the same or every single black model looks the same and that's not right at all. Her impassioned speech at the British Fashion Awards 2019 as Vogue editor Edward Eninful and Valentino's creative director Pier Paolo Piccioli watched on ensured there wasn't a dry eye in the house. To them I say this, whatever it is that you want to do, whether it's modeling or acting or medicine, you should never doubt yourself or let the world convince you that it is not possible. Because if a little dark-skinned South Sudanese refugee who comes from absolutely nothing can do it, so can you. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Thank you so much. And I remember a dude walking into the office and she was uh, in the conference room and Charles and I were in our office and we walked in and we just walked over and she stood up and she just wrapped her arms around both of us. You know, she just hugged, just gave us this warmth. We just met and you could just immediately feel this incredible soul, um, you know, within this, within this woman. Um, and then knowing about her, I mean, she really had quite a, it's been quite a journey. And I think then when you know that journey that she's go, gone on to where she is, and she's extremely, extremely attached to her family, like really, really, I mean, she really misses them if they're, they're not um, around her. And um, that just has made her even more special. Yeah, I think it's thinking of her as an amazing model 
and not necessarily just saying she's an amazing black model. She's an amazing model. She's exquisitely beautiful, a joy to be around and a dream to photograph. Adut is arguably the most successful female model on the planet today, in demand in the major shows at all the major fashion weeks. The global face of the new Valentino signature fragrance, she has graced the covers of the world's most prestigious magazines no less than 40 times. And she is a United Nations ambassador for refugees. Exactly. I think she's emblematic of a change that has been uh, a long time coming. And she is now in a position where she is, you know, before Beverly Johnson was on the cover of a magazine, it was like, Okay, a black model is on the cover of American Vogue. Now it's just part of every, oh, a dude is on the cover of Vogue. Or a dude is in the Valentino campaign. Or a dude has walked into the Met Gala. It's just because she's an amazing person and a beautiful, beautiful human being. Well, a dude we've worked with and we adore her. And she is, I think, emblematic of this um, of an amazing, talk about storytelling. I mean, where she came from and to be where she is right now is phenomenal. And I don't know if something like that could have happened. Uh, you know, there were very few of those, but Adut is, is probably, I mean, the model of the moment right now. There's, um, she's amazing. And I think, in an, in the, not to, not to, disregard any of the other black models, but even with the Caucasian models, they're just amazingly beautiful girls. And when I think, you know, I remember the first time, you know, working and seeing, you know, Iman, you know, and, and working with her early in our career. And, 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 you know, it's just like the first time, you know, Linda walks in the studio, you know, it's the first time Iman walks in. I remember the first time with Naomi, you know, and she was maybe 17 or 18. We shot her for the first time. Name and age into the camera. Alison Mason, 19. Um, how long have you been dancing? All my life. And what does it mean to have soul? It means to be you in the purest form. Here's what made me suppress my life. Succumb to my lower nature. What did I do? Fashion experts are saying that not since another African-American male model arrived on the scene in the early 1990s has a man of color started making so many waves as a male supermodel. 22-year-old Alton Mason is without doubt taking the modeling world by storm, one runway at a time. With his show-stopping good look and Michael Jackson-esque style, he credits his grace to his dance training and lifelong practice of martial arts. It's not hard to understand how Mason's popularity within the fashion industry has skyrocketed. Please welcome GQ's Model of the Year in association with Paco Rabanne, Alton Mason. Impressively named Model.com's Male Model of the Year and GQ Australia's Man of the Year in 2019, Alton Mason has played an important role in breaking down barriers on diversity and reshaping the idea of what it means to be a male supermodel in 2020. Yeah, Alton is a great younger brother. He's, uh, he did amazing. I think Alton is one of those models who bring this generation of model to a next level because he has more this 90s coolness. He, when you are with Alton in a room, he, 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 he can bring himself up. So, and that's something I'm really proud of him because uh, he did really, really great into that. And being a black man and being able to be everything because that's something I can change it in the industry. And that's, I really have a big credit and respect to give to him because young black man 
because of Alton can also dream and think they can be whatever they want. And he was that, and that's what he felt on the runway. That's what we felt everywhere. He will keep his energies, keep his attitude. And I really like it. He, yeah, he inspired many, many people and myself. Because Model, dancer, and now actor Mason plays rock and roll pioneer, the architect of rock and roll, Little Richard, in Baz Luhrmann's Elvis biopic. Directed and co-written by Lerman, Elvis explores the life and music of the legendary musician Elvis Presley, charting his rise to fame and unprecedented stardom. Mason stars alongside Austin Butler, The Dead Don't Die, as Elvis, Tom Hanks as the enigmatic Colonel Tom Parker, whose complex role as Elvis's manager is a focus of the film, and Olivia de Jong as Priscilla Presley, in LA at the time, dancing for Laurianne Gibson, Mason's modeling career began with a comment from an agent on an Instagram post in 2015. I thought it was a joke, he said in an interview with W Magazine. But then my agent contacted me through an email and I saw all the confidentiality stuff and I knew it was real. In 2016, Mason shot straight up to the big leagues, modeling for none other than Kanye West's Yeezy season three collection in the New York Fall Fashion Week. However, the turning point in Mason's career wasn't until he was selected to present Gucci's 2018 Cruise Collection, a gig which got him noticed by Gucci's creative director, Alessandro Michele. Michele invited him to model for the Italian Fashion House's 2017 Pre-Fall campaign. I've made so many sacrifices to be where I am in my career, Mason told Vogue. The highlight thus far would have to be the Gucci campaign. My little brothers and sisters are proud to know that I had a hand in a masterpiece that projected acknowledgement, inclusion, and diversity. Since then, Alton Mason's face can be recognized on runways and campaigns alike. This talented dancer turned model has worked with a number of luxury brands, including Tom Ford, Versace, Paco Rabanne, Louis Vuitton, and more. Most notably, Mason recently became the first black man to walk for Karl Lagerfeld in the Chanel show in 2018. A pioneer of diversity and inclusion, Mason chooses to use his spotlight to represent people of color and to help change the narrative of the fashion industry. Fashion is just a way to express yourself and just show your true colors. There's so much art to it and so much of a story that could be told just through clothes and, you know, through your outfits. Reflect how you were raised and, you know, the places you've been and what you've seen and the culture that you're around to this vibration. You can't really find it anywhere else. Yeah, Alton is someone who, you know, I keep in contact with. I did a shoe with him, which was, the pictures were a little bit insignificant in the magazine because they were from the front of the, of, the, of the book. And he was just kind of getting started. And he just, we were doing kind of some very conventional pictures to show off some, a young designer that was doing some really cool clothes. And he's like, do you mind if I try a few things? And his energy was just so infectious. He's, you know, he did handstands and he did, was dancing and the photographer was just going wild. We got some incredible pictures. I remember I tried to talk the editor in chief into making it a bigger story. I lost that battle, but it wasn't because the pictures weren't great. It wasn't because he wasn't amazing. So I actually keep in touch with him and we're trying to figure out how to do some sort of a big splashy story because he is absolutely brilliant. I would have to say that he's, not only number one in the world right now if of male models, but he's probably number one on my list. Now represented by state management in New York and IMG Worldwide, Alton Mason has continued on an upward spiral in the fashion industry and has no plans of slowing down. Mason himself told GQ, there's still so much to do and I want you guys to stay tuned. This is just the beginning. I'm so grateful and I feel so chosen to help change the narrative and represent diversity and inclusion. I'm not trying to be the most handsome. I'm not trying to be the most influential. I'm just being, and I'm free. I think the great thing about what's happening now in 2021, which started few years ago was the sort of fight for equality, for diversity. 
of everything, you know, diversity of looks, of race, of, you know, weight, of, you know, size, of height, of, you know, uh, sort of, it was a very, very narrow vision of what a model looked like. By necessity, they had to be because, you know, we have to make samples to fit them. So you can't, you don't, people don't have the money to make samples in size four, size six, size eight, size 12, size 18. So there was that. There was also a certain height. So there was, you know, just like everything else, there was a requirement. The requirement has relaxed a lot, which is great, you know, and I think now it's reflecting the world now that, you know, people are accepting that, you know, there is transgenderism that before no one even talked about, let alone, I mean, there were transgender models that, you know, no one knew or spoke about, you know, we we're now finding this out, you know, but they were, but this is now it's okay. It's okay to be, you know, transgendered. It's okay to be a size 18. It's okay to be, you know, have a big gap in your tooth, you know, which, you know, Lauren Hutton had in the 60s, but they made her put like a piece of wax behind there, (laughs) you know, for a while. You know, she fought it, fortunately. And, you know, but so there's a great diversity now. And I think it's great. I think that, you know, growing up as a Latin person, not seeing people that look like my family, you know, so I wanted to be blonde and, you know, tall and then, you know, it's everything I'm not, but, you know, that's what I wanted. And now you can actually, you know, if you're a child that doesn't look that way, you know, there is someone that's going to look like you who's modeling. There is representation. And, you know, I think that's great. The 2020s sees the modeling game as a business fully reinvented. Gone are the days where only a pretty face could get you noticed. Now you need a robust Instagram following, a famous last name, and or slash. Something to say. Today is all about diversity, as designers aspire for a truly global audience. In this final episode, we meet the breakout stars who will be the next wave of supermodels and hear their stories. There are a strong number of contenders for the next big thing, and these faces represent all genders and hail from all over the world. Inclusivity means to me being accepting of everyone for who they are, regardless their the color of their skin or their background or their status, whatever it is, accepting of them as a human being and that's who they are. A lot of people think that being inclusive just means, you know, using models of colour, but it also means using people of all shapes and sizes and age, and it means a lot of things. So just being inclusive of people of, you know, of all sorts. I think there's still huge room for improvement with regards to diversity. Um, Tyson was pretty much the only guy in the 90s and the 2000s that anyone was talking about. And I love what Alton's doing now. But there's definitely there's definitely room for more. Same with the girls. You know, it's Edward Enninful is doing the most extraordinary work for that on um, with British Vogue. But we need, it would be great to have a men's magazine doing the same. I think everyone's trying their hardest, but there's there's still a lot of room for improvement for sure. I couldn't understand like why was there no black people? So it's really difficult if you're someone who not only wanna like use this or oh, racism or the, like to have it easy. Like I don't wanna go black or white, you know. I just I wanna more understand what was the problem of actually the whole industry having like one of the two most famous models of all time, Tyson Beckford and Naomi Campbell being black, but not being represented as much in the large. So that was for me really weird to understand because before I started modeling, I didn't know a lot of, about modeling, but I knew, I heard Tyson Beckford, I heard Naomi Campbell. So it was weird to me to see, oh, actually we're in 2015, 2016, and this is happening now. To 
someone like myself, I don't see white. I see, I see multicolors. I see, I see, uh, I see Brazilian. I see Asian. I see, I see, I see different people as for what beauty beholds. Every race has someone beautiful in their race. And I, I feel like as a company such as a clothing brand or a advertisement or something, it is your job to find these different multiracial um, people who are, are who are great for what you're doing. You know, it, it's it's the blonde hair and blue eyes that we constantly go to, and we push this for so many decades that it's almost like stamped in your head that oh my god uh when you think of australians you think of blonde girls you know with these great tans and these blue eyes or these green eyes which is when you go to australia you find so many different you know uh beauties like you know my, uh i found my ex who was a, a brunette and you know with these amazing mix to her that you know i later found out that many different people in Australia are mixed like that. And I, and, you know, I, being an American who had never been to Australia, my first thought, and my first Australian girlfriend was blonde hair and, and, and green eyes, and she was amazing. But I then started to learn that it's not just that, you know, like, it's the same, it's the same as it is in America, where there's so many different levels of beauty, and so many colors and so many multi multi-racial backgrounds of beauty and i think a lot of the brands don't dig that deep and the male gender is not to be overlooked when it comes to the decade of diversity either there is a whole wave of fresh faces changing things the exact same way alton mason is How does one go from studying special care counselling to an international supermodel? Adonis Bosso says that visiting your girlfriend's modelling agency apparently doesn't hurt. Adonis Bosso, in an interview with ID, stated that it all happened when he dropped off some stuff for his girlfriend at her modelling agency and was signed right there and then. Born in the Ivory Coast and raised in Quebec, Bosso has certainly carved a niche out for himself. Growing up, I never dreamed big. Everything seemed so out of reach, he said to Coverture. It's crazy because I didn't even, tr I, I can't say I didn't try to be a model. It's just that I was, I was studying in special care. Basso started doing shows in 2012, his first being the Siki Im Fall Winter Fashion Show. He continued to do shows until 2013, when he achieved one of his first major editorials, Dansk, for Glossy Posse. After the Glossy Posse editorial, Bosso appeared in a H&M advertising campaign for their spring and summer collection, as well as their H&M Loves Music Rock Festival in 2013. Since then, he has worked with Dolce & Gabbana, Armani Exchange, and is even beginning a career in music. His track, No More, has received over 100,000 views in two months on YouTube, with his other two tracks receiving over 150,000 plays on Spotify. It was like uh, I started experiencing my career, my creativity all, all over, from dancing, to singing, and like doing drama and stuff like that. So that's when I, yeah, I really like uh, started to bloom as a person, as an individual overall, you know. And and yeah, it was not so much about where I was, where from who I was and where I was from. It was just just trying to fit in and grow, you know. But he doesn't leave it there. Bosso works with streetwear brands as well as luxury brands. His recent work with Adidas on their Spring 2020 campaign saw him in the same campaign as Beyonce Knowles Carter that blended streetwear with luxury fashion. 
Dolce & Gabbana was an important show for Bosso. As an advocate for diversity, Bosso appreciates their commitment to diversity in the fashion industry. I said, Domenico, thank you. You put three black boys in Dolce & Gabbana because it's never seen and it gives us validation, he told ID. The next season, he put even more black guys on the runway. On Instagram, Bosso shares less of his modeling portfolio than you might expect to his 194,000 followers. Instead, he chooses to focus his platform on activism and the raising of his son. I came in before social media was really a big thing and black models weren't really working that much. So there was still, we were still being a breakthrough or like, oh, there's a black model doing this. Oh, and there's a black model doing that. So like having a couple of us in our in shows and in campaigns and things like that was still like, a big thing. It was still like a, a it was still a breakthrough uh, for in the fashion industry and for the culture and blah, and all of that. So Bosso fights for diversity within the fashion industry. It's important to have a voice, he said to ID. Now in this day and age with social media, models are not just models. We are public figures and brand ambassadors, and we have a voice and we are educated. His portfolio still makes an appearance on his profile, a particular highlight being his shoot with Flaunt magazine. Since the Dolce & Gabbana show in 2015, Bosso exploded. The rest of 2015 went and saw Bosso everywhere from Hood Air to Corneliani to Tommy Hilfiger. It was just show after show for him and he has certainly only grown since. Bosso is now in the top 50 models category on models.com and is ranked as one of their money men. Time in Park has been skimming through magazines and watching clips of runway shows on YouTube since he was a child in South Korea's port city of Busan. After completing his compulsory military service, he worked at a shipyard before shifting dramatically to modeling. Park's ascent to success began when he was introduced to his agency by his friend and designer, Young Mi Woo. He was an exclusive in all three of his debut shows, making his runway debut in Europe at Prada in Milan, then appearing in Kim Jones's first show for Dior Men in Paris, and then walking for Raph Simmons at Calvin Klein in New York. His latest campaigns include Tom Ford's Fall Winter 2020 campaign and Hugo Boss's Suits Spring 2020, as well as the cover of GQ Korea September 2020, Marie Claire Korea June 2020, and Dazed and Confused Korea March 2020. In 2019, Time in Park was nominated for Breakout Star Men of the Year Award, and was runner-up for the Best Street Style Men Award as part of Model.com's Model of the Year Awards. He has 100,000 followers on his Instagram. He's achieved immense success in a brief period of time, recounting the whole experience as like a dream and I am still dreaming in an interview with Models.com. Even today, after countless runs for Louis Vuitton, Fendi, Givenchy, Coach, Alexander McQueen, Versace, and so many more, Park is still humbled by the kindness he receives, expressing how he felt alone and nervous at his first show in Europe, and said it was an unforgettable memory when Olivier Rizzo gave me a hug in his interview with Models.com. A Chinese dancer turned international model on a whim. Having worked with the legendary photographers, Zhen Yang Zhang has a unique look that almost distracts from the clothes he's wearing. 2019 Male Model of the Year nominee Zhen Yang Zhang is a growing star in the industry. Hailing from Beijing, China, Zhang has always been interested in traditional Chinese art, and for over 10 years he has been a professional dancer with his primary focus being Chinese ethnic and folk dancing. It was a talent scout that asked Zhang if he was interested in modeling and only agreed to do it part-time until he had finished his schoolwork. But even so, his look is so strong that one of his first shows he walked was Versace in 2017, 
for the Fall Winter 17 men's show. Zhang walked the Anna Sui Fall Winter 17 show and was spotted in the crowd by legendary photographer Stephen Meisel. Meisel and W Magazine showed the world who Zhang was and what he was capable of in an androgynous 16-page editorial titled Shapeshifter. Zhang has himself stated that this was a dream modeling job in an interview with Male Model Scene. Zhang is an artist in front of the camera. His movements and poses are so unique. He draws from his experience as a dancer to create fluid motions with a natural flow to the body. The fall of 2017 saw Zhang walk up to 18 shows with the likes of Versace, H&M and John Varvatos. But things were about to change. In 2018, given the positive reception to the W Magazine editorial, Zhang walked at fewer shows and shifted his focus towards editorials. Some highlights include his work with Teen Vogue and Paper Magazine, the latter of which acted as an homage for Stephen Meisel's birthday. Zhang in 2019 continued to work on editorials. 2019 was a big year for Zhang, as he posed on the front cover of Glass magazine, draped all in the finest Givenchy has to offer. Zhang has since worked with Ralph Lauren for their Fall and Winter 2020 advertising campaign, Marc Jacobs, Vogue Germany and Hong Kong, plus many more. It seems that Zhang has found a special talent for editorial shoots. It's no wonder as to why. His androgynous looks, the way he can move and contort his body is a perfect fit for the artistry required in an editorial. Hi, I'm Alpha Gio. Alpha Dia was scouted in a bar in Hamburg by photographer Christian Bendel and signed soon after with model work agency in Germany. The photographer, he was taking pictures in the celebration where I was working. So he came at a certain moment to me and was like, yo man, you're so photogenic. Like really you should think about like uh, doing modeling and stuff like that. You look really great on the camera and super positive and yeah, so that's like my first thought about it. But when I when I started to reach out to agencies, I got a lot of no's. So like I had only one agency in actually in Germany who were ready to sign me. And so this was also quite um, difficult to deal with with the confidence because the most agency were saying to me, we don't have the clients. Um, this why it's really difficult to have ethnic models. And, so for me, that was more about that confidence I have to deal with. If I'm able to be black in this industry. So that was my question actually for me because I didn't have like the open doors when, the, when I started. Dia's representation grew all around the world and debuted on the runway walking for Prada in Milan during the Men's Fashion Week. Since then, he's been the face of boss Salvatore Ferragamo. Givenchy, H&M, among others. I, I remember like having problems to sign with agencies um, abroad Germany also. And so I went myself to Milan and uh, had meeting with different agencies again, but this time like in real life, not only by mail. So when I got signed with uh, also there again with a nice agency, it's, was at the time a smaller agency, but uh, really nice. And they got me booked in my first season for Prada, what was actually super special because uh, there was not really a black African male models ever for Prada before, um, or that I didn't know about. And um, so when I was there backstage, I didn't know that my presence there was so important because there were people like Edward Enningful who come up and were so happy just seeing me there. And um, Pat McGrath, super happy, took picture of me backstage. Edward Enningful was amazing towards my career. He supported me. He booked me for the Pirelli calendar, which is such an amazing job. I did the Pirelli calendar with uh, Pier Giorgio and that was, that was, that was amazing. That's put me also in the next level. And 
gained me a um, lot of confidence because that Pirelli calendar was an all black cast with people like Naomi Campbell, Whoopi Goldberg, Jimon Honsoon, who used to be a model and become one of the most famous actors in the world. So I had learned so much from that week, this joy, these people, their simplicity, how simple they were, how ready they are, they were ready to help each other. Dia currently has 30,000 followers on his Instagram and was identified by Models.com as a breakout new face in 2017. He was nominated for Model.com's Model of the Year Men Award in 2019. In 2020 alone, Dia posed for several campaigns from Missoni's Fall Winter 2020 and Boss's Spring Summer 21 show to editorials with Numero Berlin and V-Man. Dia also expressed to MM Scene that it is his only responsibility as a model to leave our best footprints so the models coming next will fill them easily. In 2020, he also built the Alpha Dia Foundation, in which he uses his modeling platform to fundraise money to help his hometown, Grand Dakar in Senegal, during the COVID-19 pandemic. We say the Alpha Dia Foundation, you need a village to raise, to raise a child. That means the Alpha Dia Foundation is more about to connect people who are, want to help those children and that's mean if you want to help the children it's like their entourage their parents the schools where they're going because um growing up in certain places you you don't have the force to dream and that's for me one of the most important key like i know i can't stop hunger right away but just me as a young person like one example i was this summer in senegal and we rebuilt one school we remade that school. And when I was at that school and the students, they saw me, they, they were all shocked and surprised. Like, you are Alpha Dia, like you young, so young, like we thought this is someone old. And this is a motivation also for them to be like, oh, we are able, he's from this area. He went around the world and coming back to support us, this give them more, this give them more. Because when I do those schools, it's mostly the people in the community. We buy the materials and the people from the community come and help us to do it. So my foundation is more about that, to definitely put the people in the community in front and because you need a community to raise a child. Fashion is known to be a brutal space for mere mortals. In an industry that is highly judgy, unapologetically superficial, and given to ageism, racism, and fat shaming, it's no wonder that most of us wouldn't dream of a serious modeling career. And if you're a healthy size 14 and black, forget it. But then we are not all created equally. And some of us have the nerve to change the conversation with a level of courage and confidence that is frankly awe-inspiring. Of recent years, we've seen a slow shift away from the skinny Caucasian archetypes of beauty towards a much wider representation. And some are leading the way in style. Good luck. She's so loud. How is this feminism? She's just a model. There's no way she knows. She's so great. Enter Paloma El Cesa, a model who has defied the stereotypes like no other. Female, of mixed African-American, Latin and European descent, and a size 14. Paloma's American, English and Swiss citizenship have afforded her and her sister Arma a unique opportunity to revolutionize the space of diversity in representations of beauty. We get to figure out what a bombshell is, you know, and I guess what I would say to the beautiful community of bombshells is welcome, you're accepted here. No matter what you think you're supposed to do or look like, or how your body's supposed to be, or how you're supposed to talk, or how you're supposed to dress, or how you're supposed to do any of it, you're welcome here. How you identify your background, you're welcome here. 
that's what it means to be a bombshell. Born in London and raised in the predominantly black neighborhood of mid-city LA, El Sessa comes from an atypical artistic family that she described as hippie poor, educated but not affluent. With black Methodist grandparents, an African-American mother and Chilean Swiss father, both musicians. She and her siblings were a difficult to box multiracial minority amongst trendy white peers within the celebrity culture of LA. It made them feel like outsiders with a deep seated desire to find a community. Even though we didn't have money, my mom, she made it a point that like I got the best education. It was hard for me. I felt super isolated and out of place because my reality, one, wasn't that I had money or looked like the, my peers. I felt inherently like alone and just not right there. So I felt that like going to New York was the best idea. I feel like it's where I grew up. Nevertheless, it took some courage to step out of the arena of the usual plus size syndicate of B-grade catalogues, e-commerce work and fit modeling to enter Fashion Month's center stage. Ingrained attitudes of plus size and the constant rejections lead to something of a sense of imposter syndrome on Paloma's first showcase during Lonvan's spring show in 2016. I was looking out at all the people, all the girls, all the chaos, and was like, what the fuck am I doing here? And I started crying. A couple of our first assistants scooped me up and held me and told me, you're supposed to be here. None of this is the most important thing. It's what we do after this day that's important. I mean, and I've kind of said this before, I just kind of use it as an armor. Fast forward from that first winning debut and El Sessa's popularity has skyrocketed. Walking the runway and modeling for Nike, Fenty Beauty, Proenza Schooler, Fendi, Azos, H&M, Eckhaus Latta and Mercedes-Benz. She has also appeared in American Vogue, Vogue España, Vogue Arabia, Teen Vogue, L, W, Wonderland Magazine, and Glamour. The poster girl for fashion's decade of diversity. In 2018, El Sessa was on the front cover of British Vogue's April issue with Franz Summers, Radhika Nair, Aduta Kesh, Ferretta, Selena Forrest, Halima Arden, Vittoria Soretti, and Yoon Young Bay. Since then, Paloma, along with her sister Arma, have forayed into acting, beginning with the Safdi brothers' uncut gems. She's also made waves with Victoria's Secret's 2021 swimsuit campaign, Destination Swim, which has garnered much attention for its body inclusivity. El Sessa's influence is clearly changing fashion. Supporters of El Sessa's career have gone so far as to credit her with inspiring and revolutionizing their designs. We need to always be critiquing these just like archaic ways of interacting with personhood, you know? And I think for me as a model and an advocate for these issues, like fashion is a very powerful house to do that in. Being embraced as America's every woman, cool and sensual in one image, the girl next door in another. Paloma El Sessa embodies a new and unique American aesthetic. It has taken her to dizzying heights, giving her a place on the selection committee for the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund Award and on the Time 100 Next list for helping so many women feel powerful within their own strong and beautiful bodies. It's clear that her popularity is anything but a fad and that her rising star will be influential in fashion for years to come. My work is centered in advocating for a spectrum of bodies and I believe that I can't represent for everyone, but my voice hopefully will carve space for more people to see themselves. Once I was tied up by someone really tight in my ropes and chains, I couldn't get out. If you think you can't get out, you will not be able to get out. I remember living my whole life as male, but feeling like I was playing a part. For me, it's always been important to live as free as possible from other people's ideas of what I should be and to really live life to the fullest. Beauty is something that transcends our body. It's something that comes from your soul. 
It's come from inside of you. Actor and comedian Eddie Izzard is proud to be publicly outspoken about trans and, and other LGBTQ plus issues. Yeah, we have uh, opened events since 1985, yeah. you must count it, 36 years. And if we go back to the 1930s, if I'd been in Nazi Germany, I would have been murdered for saying that I was trans. Um, that, you know, as we know, gay people were put in concentration camps. And uh, that's what they do, that's what this extreme right wing thinking. Will do. There's no doubt that the fashion industry has a way to go when it comes to transgender representation. I think now everybody is totally open to to trans models. It, 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 I mean, in my mind, there's no issue whatsoever. And I think most people just see it. It's OK now. It, it's part of the norm. And, and hopefully there's there isn't any discrimination anymore. But I'm sure it goes on. But in general, there's, the doors are open wide. So I hope that continues. My name is Teddy Quinlivan. I am a fashion model and I'm also a trans rights activist. Theodora Quinlivan, known in the industry as Teddy, is a perfect example of where things are headed. Her career went stellar when discovered by Louis Vuitton's creative director, Nicolas Gasquier, in 2015. At 23, the popular Boston-born model walked the catwalk for Jeremy Scott, Carolina Herrera, and Diane von Furstenberg. Then in 2017, she caused a stir at New York Fashion Week when she came out as transgender in an online interview with CNN Style and on Instagram. In the fall of 2017, I came out the morning of a, another very prestigious show in an article on a major news network in the middle of Fashion Week. Why she hid what she calls her darkest secret is not only political, but historical. Harking to an environment which has traditionally been harsh to those that fall outside of gender norms. Take the popular 60s British Vogue underwear model April Ashley. When a British newspaper revealed she was transgender, she never worked in the country again. In the 70s, Tracy Africa Norman was a black trans model who hit the height of her career as the face of Clairol's hair dyes. She went on to shoot for Vogue Italia, Ultra Sheen, Avon and Essence before her career prematurely ended when she was outed as trans in 1981. Even as late as 2003, the likes of trans Senegalese model Barbara Diop found their gender status to close doors when private became public. My agency didn't know I was trans. At the time, this was something I was concealing from everybody. Concealing from my mother agent back in Boston, the one who sent me to Paris, and concealing it from my, age, my agency in Paris when I arrived. So for me, like being trans became something that I hid um, because I wanted to... I wanted to assimilate into the world and I wanted to just feel like a normal girl and I didn't want my past to hold me back from, ex from excelling and exceeding in life. And I thought that if people knew I was transgender, I wouldn't have a shot, especially as a model, but in the fashion industry in general. And so I kept it, I kept it hidden from everybody. Perhaps thanks to the 2009 appearance of trans model wannabe Isis King on America's Next Top Model, in the past decade, gender plurality has come to the surface of public consciousness, creating a new awareness and greater acceptance. In the last couple of years, advocates such as Andrea Payek and Valentina Sampaio have come on the scene as openly trans from the get-go, breaking records with covers on Vogue and Sports Illustrated and securing contracts with L'Oreal and Victoria's Secret. But for Teddy, the journey has been more nuanced. Fighting stigma, she first had to come out to her conservative parents. I remember my family was super, not super religious, but pretty religious and like we'd go to church every Sunday and God was kind of a, a big part of my growing up, um, uh, my childhood. And I remember um, praying to God every night that I'd wake up and be a girl that I would just wake up and be a woman. I didn't care if I was a pretty woman. I didn't care if I was, you know, I didn't care what I looked like. I just wanted to be a girl and I wanted to be accepted for who I was. I wasn't allowed to dress up like a girl to school, but I would hide the clothes that I stole in my backpack. And then I would go to school. I would change in the, in the bathroom, put on like women's clothing and sort of like live my, 
live like a second life. And I got bullied so much for it. You can remember back when you were a little kid, we used to talk about if someone came in and said you were purple, you would know in your heart that you weren't purple and that what they were saying was silly. My mom, I think, always knew I was transgender, but maybe was in denial of it. Maybe she want. Oh, I think she was clinging to the idea that I might just be gay. Um, and then, you know, but I, it, there's a big difference between being gay and being trans. And I just was not, I just was not gay. Um, and from that moment on, my mom really took initiative. Um, and she started to, you know, get me appointments with doctors and the correct therapists. And um, she took it seriously, which was amazing. And from that moment on, when I came out as transgender and I, and I was like, mom, I'm gonna start, I need to start living my life as who I truly am. Once her parents saw that Teddy could live in the world safely and comfortably, the process got easier. Still, she had to battle the ups and downs of hormone replacement therapy her shifting identity and inner turmoil to share her truth with the world. Teddy's decision to go public became inevitable as a political climate in the US shifted. Trumpism intensified division in the community and the sense of urgency increased. Donald Trump got elected president and I always knew that it was hard to be trans but under the Obama administration I felt like we had made so much progress on this front with LGBTQ rights and then you know one day, I, re I just remember when he got elected, I was working for Coach that day and we were shooting like outside of New York and I remember bawling, crying. And at this point I wasn't out publicly, but I knew that at like th that moment that my world would change and I knew that everybody in our country's world would change and I knew that it was no longer, it was no longer safe to be trans in the way that it had been previously. Um, and so I took it upon myself to come out to, to my agency. I, I, I walked in one day and I said, guys, I have to, I, I talked to two of my agents. I told them, I have something I need to tell you. Like we went into this private room and I said, I'm transgender. And actually like they, they were surprised. They didn't know I was trans and I was terrified. I was terrified like that my contract would be eliminated, but luckily they were super supportive. Teddy's decision has prompted a fair share of negativity, but also garnered much support from within the industry. Designer Mark Jacobs is at the forefront of these supporters. I respect and admire and support Teddy's decision to come out as transgender. Now more than ever, it's vital that we pledge our allegiance to the LGBT community and use our voices to encourage and inspire acceptance, equality, understanding and love. GLAD President Sarah Kate Ellis added that Teddy is sending a phenomenal message to transgender youth by using her personal story to show that a transgender woman can and should aspire to be whatever they want to be. Luckily for Teddy, her darkest secret has led to greater opportunity and a platform for her community. At five foot 11, with amber eyes and magnificent cheekbones, she's modeled for Chloe, and in 2019 became the first openly transgender model to be hired by Chanel. John Galliano also chose her to front the Margiela Mutiny fragrance campaign. Contrary to the usual flowery romantic branding of other perfumes, Margiela Mutiny offers a sultry, tuberose and leather infused scent that's all about defying convention and gender norms. In her personal life, Teddy is somewhat of a rebel, embracing her sexual plurality to challenge and confront. A scroll through her Instagram shows a woman who's not afraid to bear it all. With her body positive attitude and advocacy, Teddy's profile continues to go from strength to strength, and she currently ranks as one of the top 50 models by models.com. Moreover, Teddy is upbeat about the ramifications of her new role as leader of justice and equality. She has even embraced it, using her platform to publicly boycott any designer or brand linked to sexual misconduct after having experienced it herself. Me coming out in some ways helped to set a precedent that diversity and inclusion, especially when it comes to gender variance, is very important. Transgender people 
are beautiful, we are worthy, and we deserve to be in these positions. And, you know, being a model is so much more than just, just being a pretty face. You represent, you represent the standard of beauty. You represent what's acceptable, what's cool, what's fashionable, what's of the moment, uh, what, what, what deserves to be celebrated. So it's like, I felt like by coming out and by working as an openly transgender model, I helped, I mean, I felt like I was helping to prove to the world that like, you know, we are, wor we as transgender people are worthy of all of those things. Since joining the vanguard of celebrities and public figures, advocating for gender diversity in the public eye, Teddy has found herself forever battling ignorance and adverse stereotypes. Many see trans people as mentally unwell or unfit for regular work. Teddy uses herself as an example of how they can succeed in even the most judgmental of places. I wanted to be the hero that I never had growing up for somebody else. But as I've always told you, if you're bold enough and strong enough to be who you really are and to be comfortable with your differences, these are the people that change the world. I've always been surrounded by different types of, uh, of people and especially the, the, the gay and the trans community were always around me since I was growing up. And they're just so incredible. And, and I know it's, it's really hard. Um, and we just have to keep going and fighting for their rights. And today it's, it's so great to see that people like <clears throat> Teddy and Valentina are like faces of, 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 um, of that community, especially Andrea. Um, now she's acting and taking over the world. Um, yeah, but we need more people like that, you know? Uh, it's the really res representation is, is, is the key. Um, in, in the end, like you just want to show different kinds of people uh, to everybody so that that young kid in the middle of nowhere can see it and be like, oh, I want to be like them. You know? um, that power is still strong. And I think we could use social media, movies, uh, books, uh, all of it, um, to really um, explore that. Gaga's Born This Way was, was that. Yeah, that, that was the message. Be, um, be really true to yourself and celebrate life and each other. Andrea Payet, who walked catwalks in Paris as early as 2011, helped pave the way for transgender models. After making her start as a high fashion androgynous model, Australian Andrea Payet has become one of the most talked about transgender models of today and continues to smash gender barriers, paving the way for more diversity in the future. In an era that doesn't seem to be shaped by traditional constraints, diversification is flooding the industry, and Payich is certainly a face at the forefront. She was discovered flipping burgers at McDonald's age 16. Payich soon became a star. Always being one to test gender boundaries, Payich started off modeling for Jean-Paul Gaultier in both women's and men's shows, and shortly after was appearing in men's shows for Mark by Mark Jacobs. Payich's name and success skyrocketed months after appearing on the runways, and was soon seen on magazine covers all over the world. But like many of her transgender counterparts, her career was not without some struggles. Her name was synonymous with controversy in 2011 
for her cover for New York Magazine Dossier Journal because the cover featured a luscious haired blonde page removing her top because she was considered as transitioning at the time. The cover was deemed too risque for certain bookstores in the States. The following year was easier for the young trans model as her sex change was openly discussed and applauded more than criticized. Out magazine named her as one of the 100 most compelling people of 2011, and this became one of many awards she was recognized for. After overcoming many obstacles that normally wouldn't have been a problem for the traditional model, Peich's beauty and talent proved itself. She began receiving opportunities to model for the likes of Jean-Paul Gaultier, Jeremy Scott, and even DKNY. For me, it's always been important to live as free as possible from other people's ideas of what I should be and to really live life to the fullest. Uh, at the age of 18, I set out into the world and I told myself I was going to live the life of a woman and I kind of never looked back. A lot of people can be judgmental because they don't understand something. For me, courage is about standing out for what you believe in, standing out for others, I guess to live a truthful life and to add something good to the world. Let's start. I am Valentina Sampaio. I'm a Brazilian model, an actress and an activist. Born to humble beginnings in a fishing village in Akiras, Valentina was born male, but fully shifted to her preferred female identity when she was 12 years old. I had a very happy childhood, surrounded by a very big family of seven siblings in a small, humble fishing village in northeastern Brazil. But at the same time, I was also a child that had to very quickly mature because being born trans means that often had to self-reflect in a very introspective way. My parents had a very conservative upbringing. They are not a very emotionally expressed on a verbal level. So it was challenging for me to grow into myself without having been able to openly share my thoughts and emotions. I was quite alone in this process despite being surrounded by family and love. And so I would play often myself, creating my own world. In any other era, the barriers to making it in the fashion industry would have been insurmountable, and her schoolgirl aspirations of becoming a model would have remained in the realm of dreaming. Being trans in Brazil, we don't have the same opportunities. The door is closed for you just because you are trans. It's hard. I have to, to learn to fight to myself. In truth, transgender people have had a complex history within the modeling industry, largely centered around the shame and secrecy. But true to the adage, the times they are changing. I didn't really have a role model growing up, but I was very curious about a trans woman called Roberta Claus. She was very popular in Brazil with her own TV show and had a lot of attention in the media. She fascinated me. She really inspired me because she represented who I felt I was. That made me feel understood. Certainly for Sampaio, her status has become an asset, not a weakness, to her success in the industry with a very different trajectory. Openly trans from the get-go, she has managed to clock many firsts for trans models. For sure, the cover of French Vogue, acting a future film, becoming a VS Collective ambassador, being a face for Armani Beauty, and also being the first trans woman in the Sport Illustrate East Wind issue. Sampaio's story is one of confidence and pride, based largely on a supportive foundational network. At home and school, her transition was not as fraught as many others had experienced. I had a friend that was a makeup artist and he was always encouraging me to model professionally but it was very challenging at the time because people were afraid of me as a trans woman to represent their brand. Of course, no success story comes without its share of challenge. The hallmark of every cultural pioneer, they must battle attitudes, 
old-fashioned thinking and stereotypes to break glass ceilings and change outmoded systems from within. For Sampaio, her first modeling job for a clothing company ended abruptly due to her gender identity. Pulled off the ad campaign, she was told the conservative brand's clientele would not be receptive to her inclusion. My first paid job as a model was traumatic. I was on set in full hair, makeup, red to shirt, when the client suddenly fired me. She say she feared that having me as the face for the campaign would be considered immoral by the brand's customer base. I had already exactly told all my friends and family about the job, which was a very painful and humiliating experience. It took me about a year to recover from that. Luckily, during that time, I was cast in a film that was shot in Rio. It was thanks to their experience that I regained the courage to reopen myself to modeling again and move to Sao Paulo. Despite the early setbacks, Sampaio went on to feature in an independent film in Rio, which debuted at Sao Paulo Fashion Week. Sampaio walked her first runway there in November 2016. The social media and my first film really ended up becoming my greatest unexpected champions. And like my first contract came with me via Instagram. Then on International Women's Day, L'Oreal released a short film about Sampaio and made her one of the company's brand ambassadors. This is even more significant because Sampaio used the attention to shine a light on the staggering violence towards trans women in her home country, where data shows a trans person is killed every 48 hours. Brazil is a beautiful country, but it also holds the highest number of violent crimes against the trans community. Perhaps because of her loud and proud advocacy amidst a changing cultural climate, in 2017, Valentina Sampaio hit the spotlight and made history, becoming the first openly transgender Vogue cover girl. Featured first on the Vogue Paris cover, she followed with appearances on the covers of Brazilian and German Vogue. Since then, she's featured on covers of Vanity Fair Italia, Vogue Taiwan, El Mexico, El Brazil, El France, L'Officiel Brazil, and L'Officiel in Turkey. Brands have cottoned on to her currency, and she has represented Dior, Marc Jacobs, Moschino, H&M, Philip Plain, as well as being the face of Armani Beauty. By 2019, Sampaio broke further records. Less than a year after the CMO openly stated Victoria's Secret would not hire a trans model, Sampaio revealed an association with Victoria's Secret Pink and became the first openly transgender model for Victoria's Secret. Striking at the very heart of female objectification and sexual politics, she went a step further, breaking open the bastion of the male gaze by modeling for Sports Illustrated magazine in 2020. Throughout, Sampaio has spoken out bravely about her status and what it means for the industry and the world at large. I was so surprised and I feel, oh my God, really? Like it it's like, a, it's like a dream. This is me a lot like to me and not just for myself, but to all the LGBTQ plus community. Finally having a moment to be old, young, black, brown, white, like all of these things, gay, trans, it's, it, it, uh, it's time to reflect the diversity of humanity. So many things finally coming to light, you know, diversity, uh, if it's being done, not in a patronizing way, but in, in earnest, I think we have reached a point in not only fashion, but in entertainment, in music, where people of different shapes and colors and ethnicities and sexual persuasions are being treated with the same amount of respect and it's way long overdue. There are incredibly interesting new faces in the industry and that diversity is and inclusivity is absolutely happening and birthing and blossoming, which is amazing. Um, I being 52 years old and mom to two young women and 
um, and doing all that I do in terms of my activism, do not know the names of all of these individuals, but definitely know their faces. And I'm so overjoyed to see that, that there is change and there is inclusivity and diversity within this industry at this time. It's phenomenal and so, um, so overdue. No three individuals have had more of a claim to pushing this decade of diversity in the fashion business than Iman, Naomi Campbell, and Beth Ann Hardison, the three founders of the Diversity Coalition. Campbell, along with beauty icon Iman and former model turned advocate Beth Ann Hardigan, are part of the Diversity Coalition, and they're taking their fight public for the first time in an open letter to the governing bodies of Fashion Week based on what they say they saw at last season's fall shows. And they're naming names Calvin Klein, Donna Karen, Armani, and many others for using just one or no models of color in those fall shows, which featured dozens of models, calling it a racist act. I grew up in Bedford Stuyvesant, New York. That's in Brooklyn. <laughs> we didn't, you know, back in the day, it wasn't called Bed Stuy. My mother and my father were completely different, but they both were dancers. She was a party girl. My father was much more structured. He was intellectual. He was someone who was going to influence his environment. Every summer I spent in my grandmother's home in North Carolina. In those days, you see the water fountains, and one would say colored, the other would say white. And it inevitably, it was always the case. The colored one was so dirty. Beth Ann Hardison knows about the struggle of people of color in the fashion business. Born in Brooklyn in 1942, Beth Ann also grew up working in the garment district of New York City. She was a top model and is the owner of Beth Ann Management, which she started in 1984, and a lifelong campaigner for diversity and representation on the lack of diversity on fashion's runways, its magazine pages, and its ad campaigns. She was one of the black models that conquered the French in the legendary Battle for Versailles in 1973 that brought models of color to the forefront of American and international fashion. She was the recipient of the Council of Fashion Designers of America's Founders Award in June 2014. Knowing Beth Ann for, for 30 years plus, she's an inspiring character because of her energy. You know, her energy is, is not like that of a woman her, of her age. It's just, it's consistent. It's the same, it's, you know, I, I don't ever recall her ever being angry about something or, you know, she's a, such a jovial person, always in great spirits and always positive and always has a different spin on how she sees things. And the thing is, I wish I could just turn the clock back on her to give her another, you know, add another 30 years onto her life so she would be here when, when, when I'm her age, you know, because I need somebody like that to laugh and, and joke with because, you know, she's so straightforward. She's just, she's just a realist, you know, she's just a realist. She's no, no joke. I, I can, I could probably even see her during the civil rights movement, just like not to be messed with, you know, sister, sister on the move. exploded onto the modeling scene with a back-to-back -back series of groundbreaking firsts. In 1988, she was the first black woman to be featured, in turn, on the covers of British, Italian and French Vogue. Then, in 1989, Anna Wintour gave her the top prize, fronting the September issue of American Vogue, another first for a black woman. Discovered as a South London schoolgirl at 15, by a modeling agent while she was walking around the city's fashionable Covent Garden. Campbell has been in and around show business her whole life. At four, she appeared in Bob Marley's video for This Is Love. Her mother was a professional dancer and Campbell followed in her footsteps attending stage school. That balletic poise is one of the things that set Campbell apart on the runway. The camera adores her, of course, but seeing her live on a runway is a hell of an experience. In 2013, Campbell joined forces with fellow supermodel Iman, a modeling agent Beth Ann Hardison, to launch the Diversity Coalition, bringing awareness to inherent racism in the fashion system. Your body and your beauty, it doesn't matter what color you are, if you've got the right talent, you should be up there 
having the opportunity to do the job. Today she is known for mentoring young models such as South Sudanese Australian sensation Adu Takesh, whom she refers to as an honorary daughter. As she stepped out of the modelling spotlight, Campbell shifted her focus to activism and philanthropy. Inspired, she has said, by her granddaughter-like relationship with Nelson Mandela. And I feel if I'm able to open my mouth, which is something Mr. Mandela did tell me I could do when I was younger, if you can help, you use your mouth to help others, do so. If you can speak to help others. She founded Fashion for Relief in 2005 and has raised funds for Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the India terrorist attacks in 2009, the Haiti earthquake in 2010, and the Japan earthquake in 2011. She has also been actively raising money for breast cancer and has been celebrated for her work combating poverty in Brazil. The act of not choosing models of color is racist. So I'm not saying, I'm not, we're not calling them racist, we're saying the act is racist, and I'm also saying that they may not intentionally know, but they do choose, they hire casting directors, they hire stylists, and they are now the ones that choose the models, not so much, so much the designer anymore. So it's not directly the designer, but it does affect their house and their brand. We don't want them to hide behind the aesthetic of when they say, well, the show is gonna be this aesthetic this season. We want them just to allow balanced diversity. The final member of the Diversity Coalition is Iman Mohammed Abdul Mahid, known just as Iman. Iman is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, activist, supermodel from the country of Somalia. When I decided to become a model, I didn't tell my parents. I actually left uh, Kenya. I was uh, going to political, uh, majoring in political science in Nairobi University. And so one day on my, from my, on my way to the campus, a photographer by the name Peter Beard uh, stopped me in the street and asked me if I have ever been photographed before. And I was insulted because I thought, oh, here goes a white man thinking an African have never seen a camera before. And I said, of course I have been photographed as I walked and he followed me. And he said, uh, by whom? And I said, my parents. And he said, no, I mean professionally in a magazine. And all I could think of was ma the magazines that my brothers always had, like Playboy. <laughs> and I said, I'm not that kind of a girl. <laughs> and he said, no, no, I mean fashion magazines. I wasn't really falling for it. And then he said, I'll pay you. And that was a new concept to me. And I said, uh, you will pay me to take pictures? And he said, yes. And, I, and he said, well, how much would you want? And I asked for a year's tuition, which was $8,000. And he said, you got it. And that was my first business transaction as a model. <laughs> Through the 1970s and 1980s, Iman was a favorite model in Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. Fashion designer Yves Saint Laurent devoted the African Queen collection to her. Since retiring from modeling, Iman has done charity work in Somalia. In particular, about how I choose a, a, a charity because I am not one of those people who just sends a check. Um, I'd rather do uh, the legwork myself. Iman Mohammed Abdul Mahid was born on July 25th, 1955, in Mogadishu, Somalia. One of the most sought after fashion models of the 70s and 80s, Iman became a successful business executive in the 1990s with her own line of cosmetics. Married to David Bowie since 1992, she became a mother for the second time in 2000 when she gave birth to their daughter, Alexandria. She broadened the definition of beauty and her exotic looks made earthiness sensual. She helped to transform fashion into entertainment and models into personalities. Uh, somebody said to me the other day, why should it matter what's on the runway? Mm. I'll tell you why. Because to me, there is a political underlining issues of race here. The photography and runway is a really very powerful tool. The absence of people of color on, these, in this, uh, on the runways or on, 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 in photography just in, reinforces that the, our, to our young girls that they are not beautiful enough, that they are not uh, acceptable enough. That is my worry. I have a 12-year-old and I don't want to see because in the diversity that we live in, mm. the world that we live in is not what the, the runways are showing. And that to me is the concern. It's a bigger 
issue at large than just about runway and, and models. I, I met Iman uh, through Beth Ann, and over the years, you know, she's always been like a big sister. And then, you know, having a chance to work with her, her late great husband, that was that was amazing. He used to crack me up. We used to just joke and just, you know, the the little bit that I get to be in her life is kind of cool because she is a legend. You know, and always will be. And, you know, uh, I feel like they don't, the industry doesn't give her as much props as she deserves, you know, which she's the, you know, she's the holy grail, you know, her, Beth Ann are, are really, truly the holy grail. And they're just so powerful. And it's, you know, it's, I remember seeing her as a kid, like in the seventies in magazines, like, wow, who is this amazing woman? Like, ah. You know, I want a wife like that, you know? So it's, it's very powerful to see these women and has not, doesn't seem to age. I don't know what's going on, but does not seem to age. I don't, I, I want some of what she's doing. I think it's just, it's, you know, it's amazing to see them and, and when they work and when they have these, when we used to have these meetings, I used to come, show up, I sit like in the front row, like, you know, just in awe and listen to what they had to say and just, you know, just was like, wow. Because at the same time, I think I was educating myself and they were paving the way for me, my, myself as well. So I, I'd have to say it was more a female through the, a black female through the door than which opened the door for me to be able to come through the door to help other black males to come through the door and other ethnicities, <laughs> ethnicities, yeah, to be able to help people of all ethnic backgrounds. Beth Ann is, well, they're all, Beth Ann is just that she is just a very special soul that the I think everyone in this entire industry absolutely adores. She's an incredible, incredible woman. Iman is, um, as we had mentioned, one of our, when we first started working, we, we, we worked with her so far back and um, are still, you know, in, in, in touch, even little moments on, you know, a little email or a little social comment or whatever, that it's, it's always uh, incredibly pleasant, but she was just always on target. Um, in Naomi is is a, a force of nature. Beth Ann is amazing. So I think anything that those three women um, pull themselves together to do is probably going to be a worthwhile project. And I can't imagine it not being uh, successful, you know, and beneficial. To, uh, I'm sure they'll achieve the goal that they, they would like to achieve. There is change in the industry. It's very slow. Um, we have some powerhouses, Beth Ann Hardison, who's been working tirelessly for decades um, and representing incredible, you know, um, incredible folks within the industry. We have Tyson Beckford, we have um, Beverly Johnson, who is a friend of mine, and Beverly Peel, and Naomi Campbell. And we have, we have a shift and I also feel like we have to stay on that shift and that the, the challenging thing with the fashion industry is things come into fashion and things go out of fashion. And this is a very fickle industry in that we have trouble seeing lasting change in the industry because of this wave in momentum and follow the money, you know, follow the money. Um, and I look at it in other ways of, of what we've seen in terms of, you know, gender rights and equality and inclusivity. And there's all these other ways we've, I feel like we've fallen behind. Um, so I think it's going to take a united effort, absolutely. And it's going to take pressure on the industry that needs to be an organized effort to continue to see lasting change within this industry. What's happening now, as I mentioned before, the diversity is finally being celebrated. I think that in and of itself is a very important moment for everyone. Because although we don't all, you know, we're not all the same size, we're not the same color, we're of different sexual persuasions. We, we may vote differently than you or think differently than you, but we still buy your clothes. We still go to your movies and we still, you know, sell, do what we support you, it's time that you start supporting the, the, 
us in, in, in the larger scheme of things. Not everyone is a size two. Not everyone is white. Not everyone is this, not everyone is that. I think finally to celebrate those who have been marginalized for so long is a very important moment, not only in fashion, but in, in, in entertainment, in music, in, in so many of the arts. I hope I set a precedent that diversity is essential to the survival of our industry and a precedent that it doesn't matter what you look like, what's in between your legs, what color your skin is, who you choose to sleep with, what your passions are, what your political leanings are. There is a space for you in this world and that you are deserving. The whole reason why I came out, the whole reason that I fought so hard to have a career like the career I've had and to carve out a space for myself in the fashion industry is because I wanted to prove to the world that you can be different and be celebrated for that. And that's a beautiful thing. Beauty is so much more than what you see in a magazine. It can be whatever you want it to be. And I hope that through my career and through my achievements, I have proved that in a small way, at least to some people. For sure, I mean, I've taken the, the quote of somebody who calls me the Oracle. You know, she says it all the time. But I knew one thing I didn't want to have on my epithet or be remembered as is Beth Ann Here Lies, a model agent. That for sure, I didn't ever want to be. I never wanted to have a model agency. I didn't, I got talked into it and I survived it. 13 years, I said, coming up to that 11th year, I said, I gotta get out of this. So if there's anything I wanna be, one thing for sure is that I really care to make a difference. I really care to make a difference and that's for sure. And I prove that every single day. It's time to reflect the diversity of humanity. The beauty of the world and humanity is based in diversity. I don't see white, I see, I see multicolors. Diversity is essential to the survival of our industry. I think the great thing about what's happening now was sort of fight for equality, for diversity. It's bigger than just a title in this industry. It is for the little girls and boys who are not heard and seen. It is for refugees all around the world who are in a tough position in their life right now and feel like there's no way out.